faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I'll praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise
this heart that is now yours You can have it all Every part of my world So take this life and breathe on This heart that is now yours for the fathers, the heroes, the mentors and anchors, the coaches and counselors, teachers and trainers, the men who shape us and show us the definition of faithful and strong and wise, the fathers, always by our side, with us and for us, steady and courageous, ready to inspire and encourage and give us a word of wisdom, a voice of reason in season and out. There is no doubt where their strength comes from, what their hope is set on, who their eyes are fixed on, the fathers, the embodiment of legacy, humility, integrity, needed and necessary, dependable and trustworthy, 
the fathers, the men who lead and love and believe in us even when we don't, the fathers, the men who nurture and point us toward purpose, almost bigger than life, but always down to earth, the fathers, the men who give guidance, direction, and keep everything in perspective, making room for us to grow. We may never know the prayers, the tears, the sacrifices that fathers make on our behalf, yet still find time to play and laugh and rejoice in the day that the Lord has made. The fathers, the heroes, we honor you today. Happy Father's Day. So Robert Coleman is going to obey the Lord. He's a believer. Believers are called to be baptized in water. If you push water baptism too strong, there's churches that do that, they wind up baptizing unbelievers. And baptizing an unbeliever has no value, and it could actually deceive the unbeliever, say, well, I tried that salvation thing and it doesn't work. No, this seals the deal. This is in response to the desire of your heart. So we preach the gospel, people give their hearts to the Lord, and you find them wanting to be baptized. You never have, if you have to argue someone into being baptized, it's a waste of time. It's a celebration time. And if you want to be baptized, let me know and we'll set a date so you can invite your kin folks because it's a witness to them of you following through with this thing. We believe in Jesus who died for our sins, who was buried in a grave, in a tomb, and arose from the dead ever to walk in new life. So our faith is, faith is in him doing that for us. And then we, in response to what he did for us, give our lives to him, which is like a death to a self-centered, selfish life. Who knows, selfishness needs to die. <laughs> so it's a beginning. And then we bury that life by faith in a watery grave. Yes, this is a portable grave. So Robert Coleman and the members of his family are comfortable with doing so may come forward now as Robert's going to obey the Lord by being baptized. Robert, you ready? Thank you, Lord. All right. I have a couple questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins? I do. Do you believe that he arose from the dead? Yes. Have you given him your life? Yes. You're going to follow through following Jesus. So we're going to bury your old life in Jesus' name. Robert Coleman, upon the confession of your faith, and in obedience to the word of God. It is my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit, planted in the likeness of his death, rising to walk in the newness of life. Lord, bless my brother. Fill him with your spirit. Lord, may he never look back as he moves forward, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Bless you, brother. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready to hear the word? We are so blessed today. We're blessed every day to have Jeff and Sean Ferris and their family and members of this church. Jeff, years, years ago, served when our children were in youth. He and his wife served as youth pastors to the students in this congregation. And so I'm forever indebted to them and blessed by their influence in my children's life. Who knows, your children need more than just you to influence their lives. And Jeff and Sean are that kind of couple and they're both great teachers and speakers of the word. So Jeff, come right on and bring us the word today. Let's we're open ready. with prayer. Father, I thank you for your word and for the power and truth that's in it. And I thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit is here with us today. If there's anything I say that is not of you today, Father, I pray it would fall to the ground and die. But words that I speak that are from you, Holy Spirit, I pray it would take root in the hearts of those who have ears to hear and will bear much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I mean, that's how important it is in God's word that, that we take care of our families. When I was preparing for the lesson, I was thinking about Father's Day and how I didn't have a Father's Day message. But I was considering, you know, what are a father's responsibilities? And I didn't do research. I didn't look through the scripture. I just thought, you know, what do I think a good father should be like? And I came up with this list. A father should provide for his family. He should protect his child. He should ensure his child gets an education. A father should teach his child the difference between right and wrong and, and apply discipline needed. A father should ensure his child has an understanding of being a good citizen. As a Christian, I believe a father should make sure his child is instructed in the basic principles of Christianity, including an understanding of the Bible, who the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is. And it's important that the child understand the importance of having a personal relationship with all three persons of God. A father should lead not just by words, but by example. Would you agree that's a pretty good, pretty good list, right? I think if I said, hey, make a list and turn it in, almost all of these would be on, on there, and I'm sure that you would have some as well. So a father going about doing that, in some ways, that's like his ministry, right? A father serves his family. And as you can see, as I read in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, that's what we're expected to do. In fact, it says if we, if we don't, we're just, we're an unbeliever. In other words, how can you be a believer and not take care of your family? Can I get an amen? amen. The English word ministry is from the Greek word, and I apologize to the Greek scholars out there, <laughs> diakonio, meaning to serve, meaning to serve. In the New Testament, ministry is seen as a service to God and to other people in his name. Jesus provided the pattern for Christian ministry when he was here on earth. In Matthew 20, 28, and I'll give you some background on this. This is where uh, James and John came to Jesus and said, Hey, Jesus, we want to ask you something and we want you to agree with us. And he said, okay, what do you want to ask? Well, we want, when you establish your kingdom, we want to sit at your left hand and your right hand. And he said, you have no idea what you're asking for. But he went on to explain that, you know, the, the heathens and then in that world, people were all caught up in titles and uh, responsibilities and being in charge. And Jesus said, that is not how my ministry works. The way it works, he said, just as a son of man, just as I, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came not to receive service, but to give it. Amen. Giving the definition of ministry as I did and hearing Jesus talk about in his kingdom you will serve, serve just as he served. I think ministry equals service. Ministry is service. The ministry in our day has taken more of a vocational type of, of definition, I think. People think about a minister as a pastor. A minister is someone who has a church. A minister is a chaplain. A minister is someone who has a congregation, right? But in the new church that has been established, ministry, as Jesus explains it, is a minister is everybody. We are all ministers in Christ. We are all called to serve. I didn't search the scriptures diligently, but in looking through it, I saw no scripture that says, but if you are like this, you don't have to serve. There are no exceptions. If you are a Christian, you are called to serve. Put me to work. Put me to work. 
All right, I am. I'm going to do that. Put me to work. If any of you know me very well, you know I am a Texas Ranger fan. The 2023 World Series champions. Let's go, Rangers. And you know, if you hang out with me, yeah, this guy is a Texas Ranger fan. I mean, he's got a Texas, Texas Ranger sticker on the front of his golf cart. He owns an Adrian Beltre Texas Ranger jersey. He listens to the Texas Rangers on the radio. He'll watch it on TV and listen to it on the radio because he likes the Hall of Fame announcer for the Rangers, uh, Eric Nadell. But all that, my actions and my words, all support that, wow, I'm a Texas Ranger fan. What if I went up to you, Jerry, and said, how would you describe yourself? Well, I'm a Texas Ranger fan. Oh, really? Wow. How do, you, how, how do you feel about how they're doing? I have no idea. What do you mean you have no idea? Don't you watch them? No, I never watch them. Did you ever play baseball? No, I never played baseball. Can you name one Texas Ranger player? No, I sure can't. Now, I was like, this guy is not a Texas Ranger fan. He says he is, but his actions and do not support it. I am a Texas Ranger fan. He is not. I know that for a fact, too. <laughs> In James chapter 2, verse 14, 14 through 17, it says, What good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who calls me Lord will enter God's kingdom. The only people who will enter are those who do what my Father in heaven wants. And in the scripture we read earlier, Jesus said when he established his kingdom that we will serve. Jesus came to serve, and as Christians, we are called to serve. Can you say this? Faith without works is dead. And you already said you wanted to be put to be put to work, so, okay. You know, in the, in the definition I had of a father a while ago, I listed all these qualities. So what would you think of a father that sat down with his son or daughter and said, look, here's the good qualities of a father. Listed them all out, just like I did. And then he never did a single one of those things. He didn't have that character. He never followed through on any of that. Would he be a father? No, he would not be a father. Just to say that you are does not make you that Words are powerful, but actions speak louder than words. Our works on behalf of Christ must extend beyond, this is my belief, the four walls of this church. I feel so strongly about this, and you'll understand in a minute why I do. Our work on behalf of Christ must extend beyond our earthly family and beyond our spiritually, spiritual family. Ministry is service. What is your ministry? That's my lesson for today. That's my, my question for you today. What is your ministry? This in my Bible, the heading, as you see them in Bibles, talks about the Son of Man will judge the nations. Jesus told a bunch of parables in chapter 25, and he tells this parable. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. 
I was naked and you clothed me. I was, I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then he said to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And of course they said, what? When did we do that? And he said, when you didn't do it to these, you didn't do it to me. That's a pretty powerful statement when you think about it. I said a while ago, ministry is service. And Christ is laying it out. Serve. And he lays out specific areas that we should serve. When I look at our congregation today, uh, you don't have to look around. I can just tell you. There's nobody in here naked. Everybody has clothes. And I would say, unless you chose not to eat this morning, probably you're not that hungry. You're not starving. And you probably, if you wanted a drink before you came, you had water, you had a Coke, you had whatever you wanted. You had the means to even stop and buy something if you wanted it. While the church does have people that are in need, the homeless and the helpless, those in need of clothing, those in need of food, in a large part, they're not in this church. I'm not saying that people in this church don't need things. They do. And we want people like that to come. We want them to hear about God's plan for them to be provided for. But a lot of those people are not here. A lot of them are not here. So where are the naked, the poor, the homeless, the helpless, the prisoners? Where are they? I know where they are. I know firsthand where they're at. And that's why I'm so passionate about this. So many of you have heard me through the years. I've had a chance to speak up here about how over 30 years ago or around 30 years we came and how God just did a tremendous work in my life. He just blessed me over and over through my job. And I went to work for a company in Fort Worth called PDX. It was privately owned by a man named Ken Hill. And, uh, and so I went to work in 1996 or something. He sold that company in June of 2020 for $240 million. At the time he sold the company, I was the CEO, and I had to go to work for the, com- for the company that bought PDX. I worked for them for, from June to October, and then I retired. And then in November, Ken Hill died, the man I'd worked for so many years that I was friends with. I, the family asked me to do his funeral. I did. He's buried up there on Comanche Peak. Um, after the funeral, the attorney came to me and said, hey, I don't know if you know this, but Ken named you executor of his estate. I'm like, no, he never talked to me about that. But I'm honored that he trusts me enough to do it. Yeah, I'll do it. I had no idea what I was signing up for. <clears throat> it was a $43 million estate. Airplanes, cars, houses, artwork. I mean, it's just so far over my head. But I did what the will said to do. It said, sell everything I own, pay off all my debt, fund some trusts that I've set up for my grandchildren, and then the rest of the money goes into the Ken Hill Foundation, of which I'm over that. I work on the Ken Hill Foundation with an advisory group. So I didn't even know what a foundation was. So I have to... Find out what it is and what am I supposed to do. And uh, Ken, being a native of Granbury, when I met with the advisory group uh, four years ago, I said, okay, according to my understanding, we have to give away a certain percentage of this money every year to these nonprofits. And uh, so uh, I said, Ken's from Granbury, why don't we focus on having the money that we give every year go to organizations in Hood County and Granbury. And they were all from around here, and it's like, that makes sense. So we did a poor job of giving the money away the first year because we messed up and didn't know until like two weeks before the deadline, you got to give away $2 million. So 
I scrambled around trying to meet with local organizations, and uh, we identified some and gave them money. It, it, they made good use of it. But we were really prepared the second year we did this because I went all around Hood County and Granbury and met, met with as many nonprofits as I could to understand what are the needs of Hood County. What can the Ken Hill Foundation do to help Hood County? And there was a lot that could be done to help. And I think when I share with you what I'm going to share with you in a minute, you're going to be surprised at the needs that exist in this community. And as I said a few minutes ago, where are all the naked the thirsty, the homeless, the helpless, where are they? Not all of them in the world, but there are a lot of them in Hood County. And when Christ said, when you didn't do it to these people, you didn't do it to me. When you do it for these people, you, you're doing it for me, right? Not just in the church. We need servants in the church. We are called to serve in the church. But I believe we are called to serve in our community. I'll be the first one to say before I got involved in this, my, my focus was my family, my work, and my church. I knew nothing about the community that I lived in, really. And it was only through these last four years that I've come to understand, wow, there is so much that needs to be done and I have the opportunity to do it through this community, through this foundation, not just me personally, but the foundation. And then I came to understand everybody, if you're a Christian, is called to serve. You are called to serve. We're all ministers and we're all, all call, called to serve. If you are so inspired by this message, not by my words, but by the Holy Spirit moving on you, it's like, you know what? I think I need to serve. I'm going to tell you about opportunities to serve in our community with the 501c3s that the Ken Hill Foundation is supporting. That's not to say there's not a, there are so many I wouldn't I could spend just my time just reading them all out to you, but I'm going to tell you about just the ones that I am familiar with. The first one is Mission Granberry. It is the largest organization, nonprofit organization in Hood County. The executive director's name is uh, Dusty Schofield, an amazing woman, amazing woman. Uh, do you know there are hungry people in Hood County? you have any idea how many food banks there are in Hood County? Eleven. There's eleven food banks in Hood County, and Mission Granbury has the largest one. A few years ago, this is what Dusty told me, a few years ago, Mission Granberry was feeding 80 to 100 individuals every week with two days of distribution. Now they're currently feeding an average of 341 people per week or about 1,300 individuals per month. And of those that they feed, 49% of them are children. They also assemble 39 boxes of food for homebound seniors and their volunteer drivers deliver it. Three years ago, they had 12 seniors. Now they have 39. Mission Granbury also has a CASA program. That's a court appointed special advocate. It's a national sponsored program. It supports and promotes court-appointed advocates for abused or neglected children. The CASA program that uh, Mission Granbury has has 57 kids in it now. 57 kids. What you do as a CASA volunteer is you are the one that helps walk that child through the legal system. You don't have to be an attorney and every one of, the, one of these organizations I'm going to talk about, they are excellent at training you. You're not going to be put in a position to fail. But they need volunteers for that. 
and talking about homeless. So I know we have some people, the Garcia family, that reach out to homeless people. God bless you. Uh, there's a growing number of homeless people in Hood County. Uh, Dusty told me that nine years ago when she started in their system, and they're very organized, in their system nine years ago, they had 12 homeless people uh, identified in Hood County. As of today, they have 170. There's one woman that's been living out of her car for four years. There, she said there's two great misconceptions about homeless, the homeless community in Hood County. The first misconception is that, oh, the homeless people are transit in a very tiny, tiny community. And the second is that homeless individuals are just lazy and don't want to work. He said those people do exist, but it's a tiny fraction. Most of the homeless families are part of our working poor. They have jobs but don't earn enough to afford to dramatically increase rents plus utility and expenses. Mission Granberry, along with another number of other organizations, they get calls all the time. I can't make my rent. I can't pay my gas bill. And Mission Granberry uses the funds that they have and the volunteers that they have to provide assistance to these people. She mentioned that she gave me two examples. She said, just last week, and I talked to her two days ago, she said, last week we helped a young woman and her three-year-old who had been thrown out of the house by her boyfriend. And also a single father with two children lost his home during divorce, moved in a motel for what he thought would be temporary, but soon realized it was an impossible situation for him to escape. Mission Granberry and the Salvation Army really are involved in helping homeless people and volunteers for Mission Granberry are, play a key role in helping this, this homeless situation be addressed. Mission Granberry has many, many other services they offer, uh, but I'll just mention one more. Uh, if you saw me with a hammer in my hand, then you should probably run. <laughs> we were not married many years, and my wife took away my man card. But in the... In the different areas in which I serve and I'm aware of what's going on, there are so many people that need help. Their faucet is broke. The steps going up to their house are broke. Stuff that probably Alan or Gary or a lot of you could do. For me, I'm like, hmm, yeah, that's a problem. So you call Mission Granberry and they'll send a volunteer out to fix it for them. I mean, that's... That's, they have volunteers. If you're good at fixing stuff, you could volunteer with Mission Granberry. You know what that's called? That's called serving. That's called a ministry. That's what that's, what that's called. That's what it's called. The next one is Meals on Wheels, Senior Citizen Center. The organization serves those 60 years of age or older who qualify. The main goal is to alleviate social isolation and food insecurity and offer the best quality of life possible to our local older adults. Currently we have, or they have 22 two routes, which is about double what they had three years ago to give you some idea of how this, this is growing. Uh, if you're a volunteer, they, they deliver food Monday through Friday. If you're a volunteer, you get there about 10.30. Uh, you leave at 11, you've got your food, you've got your drink, you've got your sheet that's got their name and their address on it. I started to say their house, but some of the places you deliver, you would not call it a house. It's so sad. But you deliver to them, and it takes about three hours of your time. You can do it one day a week for three hours. They serve approximately 90,000 meals annually, and they have about 40 to 50 people a day, Monday through Friday, who come into the senior center and are fed as well. They currently deliver food to about 400 seniors. They have a long waiting list, and the reason they have a long waiting list is because they've maxed out their kitchen. But they are very close to achieving their financial goal to expand the kitchen and double the number of people that they serve. There's about 250 volunteers that do this. Some of them do it every day. Jerry Fairman and I do it on Mondays, and it's one of the best 
investments of my time that I've ever made. Jerry was one of the original board members of the Senior Citizen, Senior Citizen Center and uh, Meals on Wheels. And so when I decided I was going to get involved, he said, well, I'm riding with you. Because he and Sandra used to do it, and they kind of stepped away. So Jerry and I go every Monday. Um, and like I said, it's just a tremendous opportunity. I call them clients. I don't call them, I don't know what other people call them. I call them my client. They're my clients. They're my congregation. I mean, I know them all by name. I mean, I know that there are some people that knock, knock, meals on wheels, here you go. That's not what we do. No. <laughs> And I don't think that's what we're called to do. I mean, we, we get to know them. We understand what their needs are. A lot of them are abandoned. I mean, they, they have family, but their family has abandoned them. And they're not in good health. And sometimes you're the only person they see that day. You're the only one that they see. I ask them, can we pray for you? If they let me, I always give them a hug because meaningful touch is so powerful, right? So there's an opportunity for you to... Serve, And I'm telling you, it will touch your life. The people that you meet, I'll just name two of them. Wild Bill Black. This guy is no longer on our route. He's in a nursing home. He fell and uh, is not able to take, take care of himself. But he, uh, he would meet us every Monday downstairs of his um, little trailer, barefooted. He really believed in the principle of grounding. And... Uh, He's dressed here like he's a racer. This was taken when he was 83 years old. He was still participating in senior Olympic track meets and winning. And he would say about every month, he'd say, Jeff, you know, I'm a motivational speaker. So if you ever get a chance for me to speak, you, you let me know. And I feel bad I never mentioned it. I thought it had been good for the men's breakfast thing. But he loved Christ, and uh, he was very concerned about everybody's health and healthy eating. So he'd always ask Jerry and I, you guys eating well? You exercising? And we'd just lie and say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this guy, I could have spent my whole time talking about Steve Miller, the mad monk. When I knocked on his door to deliver his food the first time, he cracked it open and said, I need help. And I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, come in. So I come in and here's this huge guy sitting in a wheelchair wearing only an adult, adult diaper. And he was one of the most fascinating people I've ever met in my life. We, we ended up being friends, although he's one of the most difficult people I've ever tried to love. Uh, but he was a professional boxer and a professional wrestler. He wrestled with the Bon Erics. He won the Golden Gloves heavyweight championship division when he was 18 years old. He hitchhiked to Alaska four times before between uh, 18 and 22 years old. I mean, it's just one story after another. But uh, he told me he was a Christian, and his health failed, and he ended up uh, being in a nursing home. And I went to see him. He said, you know, that prayer you wanted me to pray, that saving thing, I think we should do that. <laughs> and we did. Three hours of your day, one day a week, and you can change lives, and you will be seeing people that are helpless and homeless that you can serve and impact. You can share the gospel with them. Rancho Brasses uh, is an organization that the foundation supports. It's uh, located, Rancho Brasses is an area out toward De Cordova. Uh, it was literally, parts of it were destroyed by, by a tornado many years ago. And they've rebuilt it, but Rancho Brazos is a 501c3 that's been set up in that, that community. And they do a lot of things, but one of the key things they do is they let kids come there after school. They get dropped off the bus, and they help them with their homework and educate them. Uh, they, uh, they teach them how to cook. They have a chicken coop. They have a vegetable garden. They teach these kids life skills, and they need help. These kids come in, they're wild, they need someone just to sit down and help them with their homework and read to them. Great, great organization. They would love to have your help. Roost Place is another one. It's out in Oak Trail Shores, same thing. Kids come after school, they need lots of help. The kids are way behind in their, in their schoolwork that come from these poverty areas. 
And if you're behind in school, in school, there's a good chance you're probably not going to finish school. And if you don't finish school, statistics say you're not going to do well in life. All they need is someone that would come in and help a kid read, help them do their homework. That's, that's what they do. The Ken Hill Health Center, that's one of the main uh, organizations that we've focused on. It, what, it is part of Roost Place. They renamed it uh, the Ken Hill Health Center. So imagine, it's pretty easy to get people to change their name if you give them enough money, right? <laughs> but if you have any kind of health care background, they could use your help. Their, their charter is providing health care for people who don't have insurance and don't qualify for Medicare or Medicaid. I mean... If, if, you're, if you're in serious problem, you go to the emergency room, they're going to take care of you. But if you are sick and you go there and you don't have insurance, they're going to send you away to a large degree. So the Kenyon Health Center is set up to allow people who have no insurance. There's a qualifying thing you have to go through to get the kind of health care that they need. And so we worked with them a lot, and I'm real excited about the goals that they now have established. So any background in health care, and you have time, they can use your help. The Salvation Army, I know a number of people here have volunteered and worked with the Salvation Army. They need help. They, they do a lot of things in the community besides just respond to disasters. They help with the homeless. They help... Well, there's just too many things to list, but it's a great organization. It's Christ-centered, and if you have time, they can use your help. Uh, I want to close by sharing two personal examples that I know of, of people who have a ministry, people who serve, just like you have a ministry, and you should serve outside the four walls of this church and it doesn't have to be with these organizations I'm just trying to make it easy for you if you don't know what to do that's a good start and you come up to me after service I will personally meet you and drive you there and introduce you to the people that can get you involved in this stuff it's it's so simple I mean this picture was taken in Israel last April uh, Sean and I went there with a group that was organized by a church out of Abilene uh, there were about 50 people on the tour. Uh, we knew two of the people, Karen and Rick Wilson, uh, were people that I knew, Sean and I knew from Brownwood, and we kept in touch with them. So they invited us on this trip. And in this picture, the man on the left is our, our guide, Mike, and the man on the right is Dwayne McMeans. He's a retired football coach. Um, he lives up in the Metroplex. Um, I don't sleep well on planes. Our flight to Israel was at night mostly. So I'm sitting there on a plane full of people wide awake. And at the end of the row where I'm sitting, there's this guy, Dwayne McMeans. I didn't know who he was. But he's got his light on. And he's got this notebook out. And he's just writing and writing and writing for hours and hours. And I'm like, what is that guy doing? And so I come to find out that he's, he was a college roommate, a high school and college roommate of Rick Wilson, the guy who invited me. So we got to know Dwayne and got to know Kay. So after a day or two, I said, hey, man, what were you writing in that book? He said, oh, well, let me tell you about it. So in 2020, early 2020, when COVID was just taken off, Dwayne and Kay McMeans had just come back from, what did he say? A tour called the Footsteps of the Apostle Paul. And shortly after their trip, when they got back, Dwayne developed a bunch of internal physical issues. Then he developed epididymitis. And uh, it's something only a man would have to deal with. Do you ever see... Well, I'm sure you have girls. You've seen a guy get hit in the wrong place and they just fall over and scream and holler and you're like, gee whiz, what the, it can't be that bad. It is that bad when you get hit in the wrong place. <laughs> this, this, this disease or illness, and it's an infection of your testicles and it is one of the most painful things a man can go through. Well, Dwayne had uh, some internal issues with his gut and then he got this. And it was, he said it was the worst experience he had ever had in his life, and it went on and on and on. 
Then in the middle of it, he has double hernia surgery. And then he developed a blockage. So at some point, you know, drugs didn't help, surgery didn't help, and he found himself in his closet, sitting in the dark a lot of times during the day. And uh, he said he thought a number of times, I don't know that this is a life I care to live. His wife Kay uh, said, uh, and he had anxiety and it led to depression. That's when he ended up in his closet all the time. So his wife suggested, he said, that you need to start trying to focus on something good and write it down. And he replied, there is nothing good in my life. And this is a strong Christian man. I mean, he was down, down, down. But he started writing. He started writing out scriptures about anxiety. And then people started sending him scriptures saying, hey, I'm praying over you. I'm praying this, this scripture over you. So he started writing it down. So then at some point, the Holy Spirit said, you are going to write scripture and share it. Then the scripture started putting people in Dwayne's life. And when prompted, he would ask, what's your favorite scripture? I'd like to pray that over you. He's having these, he's asking questions to waitresses, total strangers, just people that God puts in his path. And the Holy Spirit says, you need to ask them what their favorite scripture is so you can pray over them. So this has been going on for four and a half years. And he's currently written, writes 480 scriptures monthly with 280 being verses that were given to him in response to his question. What is your favorite scripture? I would love to pray it over you. At the end of each month, he's finished a journal. Something kind of like this. Uh, He's finished a journal. And God puts it on his heart as to who he should give that journal to. And he mails the person the journal. But here's, here's the good part. If you give him a scripture, you have that conversation with him, then he's writing it every month in this book, right? And then... at the once a month, you get a text message from him that, with your scripture that you gave him. And he said, I'm praying over this for you. And this was a scripture I gave him in uh, Israel, Mark 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And he gave his life as a ransom for many. So every month, Dwayne's writing that down, and every month... I get a text from him reminding me, remember, this is your scripture. I'm praying this over you. And 250 other people, and the number's growing, are getting this text from him. That is a ministry. That is serving. Is that something you should do? I have no idea. But God has a plan for you to serve. Every one of you, he has a plan for you to serve. It could be this. It could be, right? Say this, Lord, what is my ministry? The next example of ministry I want to talk about is my mother, Dottie Ferris. Uh, She died on April 18th of this year. I read, one of the reasons I retired is so I could spend more time with her. She lives in Waco. And uh, I actually did her funeral without crying. Uh, so surely I can do this. But my mother was a servant of the Lord. She loved him with all her heart. She read the Bible through every single year. And she, from the time I was a little boy, served the Lord. She was my Bible school teacher. She I mean, when she got older and and got into her profession, she was a histologist. She got involved in the Women's Business Association in Brownwood. She's elected woman business person of the year for I don't know how many years. And she did things like uh, Reach for Recovery. She led a program for women that had breast cancer. And there's a program that that she would, she would, she, of course, she knew when they had surgery because she worked in the hospital. She'd be the first person up there to talk to them and give them a booklet. And she had had breast cancer, and so she had a great testimony to, to say. And I knew that she had a prayer list. She was a prayer warrior. I knew that she sent out cards. I got, you know, everybody in our family would get a card like this. 94 years old, she gets on the Internet and prints out all these little happy sayings, verses, 
I mean, it's so customized. And uh, then she has a scripture and a little note. A no, number of people in here have gotten cards from her. And uh, so on the 18th of April, I was supposed to go see her anyway just to visit. And I get there and she's still in bed. And uh, I get there and she's still in bed. And I said, Mom, we're supposed to go to Dollar General and get something to eat. And she said, I don't feel good. I called her doctor. They talked to her. I said, let's take, take her to a clinic. So I take her to the clinic, and they do some tests on her. I said, we should take her to the emergency room. So the ambulance takes her. I have to wait 30 minutes to go in. And in that 30-minute period of time, she had really declined. So I walk in there, and I was like, oh, gosh, this is not good. She's having trouble breathing. And the doctor comes in. He said, well, Miss Ferris, your organs are failing. Your heart's not doing well. Here's your option. We can do this. We can do that. We can do this. And uh, she's looking, her beautiful blue eyes. And she said, he said, I said, Mom, did you hear him? What, what do you want to do? She pulled her mask and said, I'm ready to go home and see the Lord. And put her mask back on. And... Uh, so, anyway, the doctor said, okay, okay. So, they leave, and they have her hooked up to different medications and stuff. And I wait about five minutes, and then I walk in. And, hey, did you not hear her? She's ready to go meet the Lord. Why are you have? She needs to get unhooked from all this stuff. Oh, yeah, we'll do it. So, they came in, and they did. And uh, then she got really quiet, and she's asked me to recite the 23rd Psalms, which I'm not good at memorizing verses, but I do know that one. So I whispered in her ear some, and she's sitting there with her eyes closed. And then, and then she said, Psalm 62. And I found out later in her daily Bible study, two days before that, she had read Psalm 62. Her sister told me that. And so I got it out, and I read, and it starts out, Where else can I go but to you, Lord? You are my refuge. So I read that to her. And she was quiet for a few minutes, and then she opened her eyes, beautiful blue eyes, 94 years old, looks up to heaven, says, Lord, forgive me for the times that I let you down. I love you, Lord. And then she began to pray by name for all our family members. It was unbelievable. It's such an honor to be there holding her hand, right? And then she passed. So, you, many of you have been through this. Now, you are charged with, okay, we got to get this stuff taken care of. Wrap this up, right? We got to go through her stuff. So, that's when I came to understand her ministry, her card ministry. She probably gave out between 250 and 300 people would get cards from her. Birthday cards, anniversary cards, get well cards, people I've never heard of. She was sending them cards. And the crazy thing about it is, because I'd say, Mom, are you bored? No, I'm too busy to be bored. When I went through her desk, if you ever got a card from her, there was a vanilla envelope with your name on it, and she had written in there what she had pasted in your card so you be sure and never get the same thing next time. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Then I found her prayer books, journals, journals, page after page where she's written down people who she had been asked to pray for or someone had called and asked her or she was aware of. I don't know any of these people, but I knew a lot of them. In fact, I told Steve Crawford, said, Steve, in fact, this is a book. Steve, you're in my mom's prayer book. I want you to know she's been praying for you. He didn't even ask for that. I, I, he, she asked me. I remember when Steve lost Susan. She said, how's Steve doing? <sighs> okay, I'm going to pray for him. He was in, he's in here, right? So, book after book after book, people after people after people, she prayed for every day, every day. That is a ministry. That is serving. Ask the Lord, what is my ministry? He has a plan for you. James 2, 14 through 17. 
We read this a while ago. What good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save you? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's dead. Ministry is service, and service is work. To be clear, I'm not saying you're going to work your way to heaven. I'm not saying that. We're going to heaven by the grace of God, and having accepted Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But our life that we live should reflect what we believe. It should. Ask yourself, am I serving? Am I serving? Am I serving? My mom, 94 years old, she was, and she was serving. So it doesn't matter what you're, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're, you're not disqualified. You are required to serve. Holy, 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 and all the saints adore thee. God bless you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Was that not the perfect Father's Day message?
it, it's the Good Samaritan, Good Samaritan story in action. And the question asked that Jesus answered with that story was, who is my neighbor? They wanted to cut some people out. And Jesus basically said through that story, it's not who is your neighbor, it's who can you be a neighbor to? This is Heavenly Father's Day. Who can we be a father to? Who can we be a mother to? Who can we help? Some people may not be in a legal prison, but they're in prison in their home because of disability. So thank you so much, Jeff, for reminding us of these principles and opportunities that are all around us. No one need be frustrated. I don't know what my ministry is. Find somebody and let love meet its destination for you. And let's help Granberry be all that God has called our community to be. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. His shalom, peace, which means wholeness. It's peace that's based upon conquest, not upon compromise. It's peace that passes all understanding. May the Lord give you that. Thank you again for worshiping with us. God bless you.